Okay, my name is Atle, Atle Brynestad, and I'm the owner of this crystal factory. It was founded in 1762, so it's more than 250 years old. It was actually founded by the king of Denmark, when Norway was a part of Denmark. And we are, being, we are the oldest uh, industrial plant in Norway and we have been producing uh, crystal glass for more than 250 years and we do it exactly the same way as we did 250 years ago with, uh, with wooden pieces, with uh, leather pieces and uh, really, really the, the tradition of, of Norway. This factory has been operating while we have had, I think, 14, 15 different kings in Norway, and the factory has always been there as a part of the Norwegian heritage. You know, here you can, you can come and see how they're making the glass the same way they, as I did, I mean, for 250 years. You can even, you can even come here and blow your own glass uh, and bring it with you home. And you can see the history of the, of the glass making. The most fascinating is to see the glass blowers in live, because uh, when they're using this melting glass, they're making the most fantastic pieces uh, of art pieces or wine glasses or historical pieces. So it's just amazing to see how they're making it. It's really worth coming and see Holland Glass work.
his uh, original name was not Gustav Egeland, it was actually Adolf uh, Gustav Torsen, but he loved his uh, grandfather very much and therefore he took the family name of his uh, mother. He was born down in a, a little town down in southern um, uh, Norway called Mandal in 1869 and he died here in Oslo during World War II in 1943. He was the second boy of four boys and he always wanted to become a sculptor and already at the age of 15 he uh, left for Oslo to become a sculptor. He returned again to uh, Norway where he first was very very poor before he made this special deal with the municipality of Oslo in 1921. And then they agreed upon that the city should give him a park uh, an apartment, a studio, a future museum, all the material he needed and also all the assistance he needed. And that is how this park became to be. The park is 89 acres big or 32 hectare, you say in German, and along an axis of 850 meters we have 212 statues, either out of bronze, granite or wrought iron. And if you count every single um, figure of all these uh, 212 statues, you come to 671 figures. And all these statues, Gustav Igland has first made in full size, out of plaster, uh, before he left the further work to his assistants, either pouring them out in bronze or chiseling them out in granite. great painter Edvard Munch. He uh, was born in 1863 and he died in 1944. He was born in a little town a little bit further north of Oslo which is more known for its aquavit. He moved to uh, Oslo uh, as a young boy. And, uh, one of the most famous pictures which would give, really gave him the tip off to become a real uh, uh, a uh, famous painter that was the sick child and it started out with uh, being a scandal, a, a, a successful scandal you could say because that's when people got to know about this uh, new artist and that really set him off on uh, his career as an artist. He never married because he um, was quite sure that um, uh, he didn't want to bring on the weaknesses of the family uh, the mother dying of consumption, his older sister Sophie who died when he was 14 and she was only 15. All these happenings during his life influenced him further. This is what he expresses through his paintings. He also uh, painted uh, the screen which is actually up from the uh, eastern side of Oslo. Uh, it's a place there which we now call the curve, the screen curve where he used to walk, take walks, where he all of a sudden got this feeling of anxiety, of uh, loneliness. And um, this is sort of the picture which really reflects expressionism. You know, express the colors, express the feelings of uh, uh, the painter.
drove into the historical city. And there, of course, we started with a highlight of Rostov St. Mary's Church with the astronomical clock from the 15th century. It's a, an astronomical clock that works on a gear mechanism, so mechanical gears that work in, within the clock and have to be rewound every night. Farmers used to go there because they have the moon calendar there, for example, uh, with the help of which they could see what were the best times to plant their wheat and their when to harvest it, etc. It's the oldest of its kind that is still working. This, I think, is a fantastic chance to see Hanseatic um, masterpieces of their kind.
had a river cruise and uh, the duration is about 45 minutes. We will go from Warnemünde to uh, the center of Rostock basically and today um, some of the uh, most important industries of Rostock like uh, the three important shipyards that we had saw something uh, yeah, from the outer districts of Rostock and um, yeah, mostly it's, it's the industry part that is located near the river of uh, Vano that it's called and uh, Rostock is strongly connected ever since uh, to this river that's what the history started with This year celebrated its 800th anniversary and uh, so it's uh, a city that had the right to be called itself a city since uh, 1218 and um, so everything is like uh, from medieval ages and uh, there are lots of buildings that are very old and from uh, or dating back to this time and uh, so was the gate that we saw that is called Kröpelin Gate. is called uh, St. Mary's Church. Um, yeah, the first there was a church and uh, dates back to 1232. Uh, so uh, a church on this place was mentioned uh, first in this time. And uh, this church collapsed afterwards. So uh, the church we see now, the, the main basilica was finished in 1440 and uh, the steeple in the uh, 18th century somewhere. So, uh, it was a Catholic church first and after Reformation it uh, got Protestant and um, they still hold services in this church. It was a very important part of uh, the yeah, opposition in the GDR times. Magic is that it's connected or that it's very close to the Baltic Sea so uh, you have direct train connections and uh, always fresh air so the air quality is very high and um, yeah you can just go to the beach with it whenever you want so Tallinn is since the 13th century really as a town, so since the uh, 1248. So we must say the 13th century it's quite old and it's a time when it was given the right to be a town as it belonged to the Hanseatic League, it was a big merchants league. Uh, 
The first stop we made was at this tall Herman Tower, and it's important that it's one of our uh, symbols of Tallinn, and it's next to the castle, which is today really our government or our parliament house. We saw it has two churches. One of was this Russian Orthodox Church, which is the Alexander Nevsky's Cathedral. So this is uh, yes, uh, where a lot of Russians uh, go, and the Estonians are Lutherans, and they go to Lutheran churches mainly. There are also Catholic churches, but this church was the uh, St. Mary's Cathedral, and so it's also from the 13th century, and it's our main church, or main cathedral, and Estonia is Maryland and dedicated to St. Mary, so that's why this church is also called St. Mary's Church. And it's, it's one of the oldest, and uh, there's the inside there is the 17th century uh, coat of arms and tomb, so that's interesting to see it. And uh, it's important that the town wall is surrounding the whole part of Tallinn. It's important that the, t uh, the town has these cobblestone streets. That's why which kind of streets there were really during the medieval times. Of course they have made them today not a little bit smoother and it's possible to walk on them but to have the image of this old town. The downtown, which is uh, the merchant's town and the handicraftsman's town. So this is like the, where the dwelling houses were from the 14th, 15th century, where the merchants were living and their guild houses. That's where it was the most important um, market, the medieval market where the merchants came with their goods. This is where we have our medieval and one of the oldest uh, town halls in Northern Europe in the center, so these are places are worth visiting and seeing today. As I say, it's only 400,000 people living in here, but it's quite cozy and this as the town town is uh, not so small and not so big, so you can just uh, fancy it and find interesting yards, find nice souvenirs. And I think the people are also uh, nice, they, they speak English mostly, so it's easy to just uh, find the way and ask people help. And uh, for the tourists in this way, it might be helpful and nice to go around. Well, the Peterhof Palace uh, was founded by Peter the Great in order to be the rival of the Versailles Palace. And uh, then it was 
changed and um, improved by many of the Russian monarchs. So the first one was his uh, daughter Elizabeth, who ordered the uh, grander look, the more beautiful decoration inside and outside. Catherine the Great, who changed the interior mostly, she didn't touch the exterior of the palace. And after Catherine the Great, every Russian monarch would change something, would add some something new, something interesting, something beautiful, something unique. Well, we, we know the staterooms are there, we can count the staterooms, but there are so many downstairs and upstairs where no one would ever be allowed to go. And uh, so uh, there are definitely more than 100 rooms, I would say 165, but uh, we need to check this. The palace is unique in terms of uh, being um, one of the um, Baroque palaces and uh, yet combine many different styles inside it uh, and yet being in the harmony with each other. So I believe that this is the peculiar thing about the place and the, the palace itself as well. of all, of course, the uh, thing that uh, it is the summer residence with the unique system of fountains. So the Peterhof, not only speaking about the palace, but just because about the place, it's definitely, um, I believe, the only place uh, created in such a way so that the fountains do not need any palms to walk. Gardens, they were the upper garden and the lower garden, they are separated. The upper garden is uh, free, uh, the access is free. Uh, it first uh, it was intended to be uh, a royal garden, so they would grow fruit and vegetables inside it. And then later uh, it was uh, turned into a French style garden, a French style park, so the, uh, trims are, the trees are trimmed in uh, different forms. The lower garden contains more fountains and uh, everything is symbolic, so the fountains symbolize either the victories or the, uh, the calm seas or um, some virtues of the monarchs uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, there are some trick fountains in the lower park which um, were intended to be amusement for the visitors and for the emperor. A few kilometers away from Peterhof, or about 30 kilometers away from Peterhof, and uh, the Ropsha Hills are 55 meters or above the sea level. So that is why uh, the streams come from the hills, or uh, the streams with clean water come uh, from there. The water is um, 
stored than in the um, ponds which were dug out. So three, three ponds exist to store the water at night. The water is allowed, so in the morning at 11, the grant or cascade are starts and opens. So that is where when the, um, the whole water is stored during the night, just uh, stream to the main fountain. Catherine's Palace uh, is uh, one of the most impressive palaces and it's a summer residence. Uh, uh, the palace is 300 meters long, beautiful blue and white colors and a lot of gold inside. Uh. Of the, eight, of the 18th century, when uh, this palace was enlarged and taken care of by Empress Elizabeth, everything was much bigger than we have it now, than we can afford it now, actually. I uh, can imagine Elizabeth was uh, having great receptions and uh, always appeared in a new dress, and uh, her dresses were all big, and every her lady-in-waiting had an, uh, another dress of this size, all uh, impressive and decorated with all the most precious uh, fabrics and jewelry, and had a uh, decoration of colorful, precious stones all over, and uh, uh, they were coming to the palace in a carriage decorated with golden stones and uh, even the horses sometimes were decorated with uh, pure gold things decorated with Colombian emeralds. Uh, so uh, it's hard to imagine now but uh, they could afford this and this is not only a question of money but this is how they understood their way of living in the 18th century and when you get to the Catherine's Palace uh, uh, you can understand that uh, you can feel yourself in this atmosphere of everything being really grand impressive, uh, shining, and enormous, and enormously beautiful. Catherine's Palace is like 300 meters long, and inside we have a gallery, which looks like endless gallery, uh, with uh, every single room uh, decorated with beautiful 
overdoor decoration, all gilded wood carving. And when you look through this gallery, you don't even feel where it ever ends, if it ever ends anywhere. Uh, the Amber Room originally was uh, uh, made back in the 18th century uh, and then stolen in the course of the Second World War uh, in the course of occupation and uh, a lot of things were done to find the original one but then uh, a new one was made and now we have the complete replica of uh, the Amber Room and uh, it took 25 years to make it and 8 tons of amber and uh, it's impressive, uh, beautiful and very unusual. The first highlight of the Catherine's Palace is uh, the Grand Hall, which has a size of about uh, 1,000 square meters, uh, 300 mirrors, uh, 700 candlesticks, and impressive uh, uh, canvas over your heads. The canvas is very much original. started today from uh, Helsinki city centre and drove through the main street of Helsinki with all the best sites of the city and then went to the farm uh, at Savi Järvi, lovely lovely spot with horses and we were actually quite lucky today because they are just going uh, to have a competition during the weekend so we saw extra many horses. with a lovely coffee break in a country number one coffee drinking of course. Yes, we did to, to see the second oldest town of Finland, it's called Porvo, where a taste of the local uh, chocolate company, Brunberry, chocolate liquids and so on, and then a little bit of walking to the old uh, cathedral area.
and at the center square we're gonna see the main buildings from the architects, the most known architect of Helsinki, Karl Big Engel, and the uh, main work of course being the cathedral, so the Lutheran cathedral, that actually it was finished in 1852, it was the last building that Karl Big Engel was working at in 1840, but actually it became a cathedral till 1959. magical Helsinki. Well, Helsinki has lots to offer, so I always tell people that it would be lovely if they would actually come back, so they get just a little taste of what Helsinki has to offer. My name is Josefina. I am actually from Mexico, but now I have both nationalities, so Finnish and Mexican and I am a tourist guide here in Helsinki. The stop today was the Senat Square, what is like a heart of Helsinki, the living room of Finland. Um, there is a very important buildings like a cathedral, there is a state council, so a prime minister world, the working room, the university. And we have a lot of happenings there, like a concerts, it's a really lovely place. stop was the Temppeli Aukion Kirkko, the rock church. Um, that's a very unique church. It's a Lutheran church built in 1969. Uh, it's built inside of the rock because our base rock here in Finland is granite. So it's built inside of the granite and it's designed by the two Finnish architects Timo and Tuomo Suomalainen. Very unique building. The last stop is the Zipelius monument. Our national composer is San Zipelius, so this is a monument for him. Uh, there's a, the sculpture is made of the stainless steel. Uh, there's a, more than 600 of stainless steel tubes, and it looks like a pipe organ. 
but the artist who designed it was a woman called Eila Hiltunen and she was actually thinking about the Finnish forest about when she was designing this. So we always say, you, say use the, your imagination when you look this monument. The magic of the city, of course, is the people here. It's uh, of course the sea, and we have a lot of nature. So, of course, in the summertime, a lot of light, so uh, light nights. We went to the City Hall of Stockholm, that is a landmark of the city, that has become famous for its Blue Hall with a Nobel Prize uh, banquet is organized, but also the Golden Hall decorated by 18 million golden mosaics. And, um, well, the mosaics, they're telling the history of our country during a thousand years and uh, a lovely building from 1923. Uh, I'd say a must when you come to Stockholm. You can discover the the queen of the lake uh, who is sitting, she's surrounded by the western and the eastern world and you can see things like the um, Statue of Liberty, you can see the Eiffel Tower of Paris, but you can also see the Church of Hagia Sophia of Istanbul. They're represented uh, on the world, uh, among a few things uh, telling about the world. was a warship that sank in 1628 and it sank right here in the port of Stockholm and after only 15 minutes of navigation. It's a ship that has been on the seabed for 333 years and was resurfaced in 1961 and it's been a museum to visit where you can see 98% of the original ship.
there are many things of the wood carvings um, that are very well preserved because they've been protected under the mud and the silt of the seabed. Uh, the king wanted to show uh, his power, his uh, the prosperity of the country, so uh, he was like creating the image of his power and uh, the country uh, when they were decorating the ship because all the symbols of the ship should tell of the prosperity and the wealth of Sweden in the 1620s. That was a, Sweden was a huge country then. Palace of Stockholm, um, the official residence of a royal family that where they moved in in 1754, and it is the um, the residence where king and queen receive uh, foreign guests. They give banquets. Our king receives new ambassadors, and um, the state apartment that is part of our visit is. Um, has its original interior design and decorations from 1754. My name is Annika and I'm a local guide in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. 